Um, good, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on your time zone, and welcome to the, this new session of uh, seminars, of, of lectures uh, organized by the Language Management Interdisciplinary Research Group at the University of Ottawa, uh, which I thank uh, for, for the invitation. And I'd like today to um, uh, present a uh, discussion paper on the politics and the policy of uh, multilingualism in the, the European Union uh, after Brexit, uh, and, and uh, which which is going to be <coughs> the the platform, let's say, for the discussion, the live discussion uh, next uh, week. Um, I'm I'm going to organize this uh, short lecture in three. Um, parts. Uh, the, the first and the second uh, part would like to present you some general uh, considerations and remarks about the role between uh, politics, policy uh, and uh, of multilingualism and the economics of, of language policy in general. So to give a kind of uh, theoretic, very general theoretical framework before uh, turning to the specific case of multilingualism in the European Union um, after, after Brexit that is completed this year, that was completed in January next uh, this year. We are still in the transitory period, but um, negotiations, COVID permitting, are still going on. Uh, should be, uh, if everything goes as planned, uh, the transitory period is going to uh, end at the end of 2020. So, uh, in the first part, I'd like to present, uh, to discuss actually some the relationship between the role and the nature of government on the one hand and language policy and therefore the politics of language on the other hand. And then to introduce some concepts from welfare economics to uh, better clarify uh, the role of government in language policy, in language policy issues. Um, uh, I think we all agree that the central aspect of the linguistic environment in any country is the set of uh, linguistic choices made by the government or uh, the state. I use the two terms here as equivalent, although they, they are not uh, the same. I, I use the term government here to include um, different uh, branches of, uh, uh, of the state apparatus, uh, so the executive, the legislative, uh, ju ju the judiciary, but also the public administration uh, by and large. <coughs> In that sense, the two words are used here as synonym state, I mean the state apparatus first. Um, and uh, I, I, I like to very often to quote this uh, um, section from, from uh, a paper uh, written by a Belgian philosopher, Helder de Scooter, on uh, language policies, and he echoes uh, another um, uh, of a book by Will Kimlicka, um, and both say uh, the same thing, and uh, essentially, I quote here, uh, they say that uh, language policies are cannot be avoided to some extent, at least, because in making policies on, I quote, among other things, education or simply courtroom practices, states unavoidably uh, have to make linguistic decisions, linguistic decision or linguistic choices. Fully a linguistic state, state policy simply do not exist. So the state can be benign vis-a-vis -vis religion, not necessarily a state, a government must endorse one specific religion, but it must endorse at least one specific language. Um, and therefore, the author continues, the correct opposition, therefore, is not one between linguistic freedom or linguistic laissez-faire and linguistic regulation, but rather between different forms of linguistic regulation, uh, so between different types of language policy, different forms uh, of language policy. 
In other words, he concludes that there's no zero option in the field of language policy. We cannot not intervene. So what do we mean exactly we cannot not intervene? Uh, well, there are different degrees to which this, this statement is correct. So we must do a distinction to better clarify what we are talking about. We must make a distinction between uh, fundamental functions that any government um, exerts, uh, guaranteeing law and order, uh, publishing legal texts, uh, websites or institutional website of the executive, for example, or uh, of the constitutional court or tribunal, um, uh, regulations of any, uh, of any kind. Uh, public administration is something in which uh, any state, any government is involved to different degrees, of course, depending on the area of competence and uh, official documents, as I already said. So these are all fundamental functions that any government uh, must, uh, must make. Uh, governments uh, provide also different uh, publicly provided goods and services with a linguistic component, as we are going to see uh, uh, later. So essentially, uh, we must make, uh, we must start from this observation, as as uh, as uh, the author mentioned before, that there are some fundamental functions that are by nature, but their own nature exert uh, by um, by uh, by governments. Uh, such as uh, of the publication of official documents or languages used in courtrooms uh, that are necessarily provided in at least one language. And there are also other goods, uh, the author mentioned education. Um, these goods, for example, uh, education or health care in many countries are provided uh, by by the government, and not only uh, together with the private sector, there are also private schools, private universities, private hospital and clinics, but in many countries, uh, education, especially at the primary level, is essentially provided by the government, and and uh, and the languages are used uh, in uh, in this context. They they these services and goods have a linguistic component. So these are fundamental choices of any government. So the, the language choices related to the very functioning of government as such. And there are also then uh, other uh, language policies with much more specific objectives. Um, uh, for example, teaching uh, one specific language uh, uh, as a foreign language in, in schools. So, on the one hand, you need at least one language to teach whatever subject, and this is already a language policy, let's say a fundamental language policy. So you decide to teach one uh, subject in a specific language, uh, you cannot teach a subject without a language, so this is a fundamental, as let, let's, let's use a, the term structural language policy on the one hand. Then you have other language policies, for example, adding one or two foreign languages uh, to to the to, to the curriculum, or uh, uh, use uh, more than one language in in road signs, for example, at the airport, uh, or in train stations where many tourists go uh, and, and or pass through. So, um, uh, basically, uh, teaching, for example, uh, a language or promoting the linguistic integration of migrant is also deliberate language policy with specific objectives in the sense that you add um, uh, a language uh, to existing services or you teach one specific language on top of uh, other languages that are already taught. Um, so we must make uh, distinctions between these two, uh, these two types of language policy that are of course related, but I cannot go too much into details. So language choices cannot be avoided, um, and uh, especially as regards uh, the language choices associated with fundamental functions of any government and to the provision of um, uh, the public provision of goods and services with a linguistic component. So as choices must be made, uh, a situation of absolute linguistic equality is in practice very very difficult. So it's not very easy to accommodate any language 
existing within society. Recall that most societies in the world are multilingual due to the presence of traditional minorities, migrants, uh, mobile people, etc. So uh, it's very difficult to find a country that is completely monolingual. Actually, uh, probably there's no such a country in the world. Uh, so to different extent, uh, of course, uh, language policies can exclude some people or not. I made the example of languages used in train stations, in leaflets, where many tourists come. That's a clear uh, example uh, in which many languages are used for practical reasons, but there are other uh, areas, other regions where tourists usually don't go, where um, uh, or very seldom, <clears throat> not very often in any case, where perhaps uh, it's much more difficult to guarantee the presence of any possible language. So, uh, as uh, choices must be made, and uh, choices means to in choices, these, li these choices, linguistic choices, involve also the use of resources, symbolic and material, then there is room for uh, negotiation and conflict, and therefore for politics. Uh, the politics of language in this lecture will refer to the conflict of interest arising between different groups that live in the same territory. Think about, for example, different linguistic groups sharing uh, territory, so living in the same country, uh, but have these people or people belonging to this group, they have different linguistic repertoires. Uh, so as soon as there is scarcity, uh, of resources, then there's competition to use these resources, either symbolic or material, and then there is room for um, for politics to arbitrate these these conflicts. So, uh, as I said, there are some language choices that must be made because they they are linked to the provision of goods and services. Uh, that the state necessarily must provide or the that are linked to the, uh, the, all, the, the, the nature itself of government as, uh, as a bureaucratic apparatus. Uh, and we can call this the, the, the fundamental language policy, so the language in which the government functions, um, the use of languages used for official purposes and in general for public provision of language related goods. For example, as I said, teaching math, you cannot teach in math or uh, geography in without a language, so one language at least must be used. And this choice uh, is not neutral, is not neutral, uh, because uh, it creates in, in practice uh, an, an initial distribution of material and symbolic resources in favor of those with an educated command of a language chosen. And this entails for people not fluent uh, in, the, uh, in, in the official language that entails you know, um, uh, a burden for speakers of other languages that must adapt to the official language policy. So in other words, uh, uh, inter um, um, the government uh, can choose to use one, two, three, four, five languages for official purposes, for example, uh, depending on the, what is this choice, depending on the result of this choice, whether to use just one language or to use more than one, this choice as such is a form of language policy which I call fundamental language policy and it's not neutral because it creates a distribution of resources in, uh, in society unless uh, everyone is already fluent in the, uh, the official language chosen. So, but this is, as I say, very rarely the case. In most cases, there are minorities living in, in countries and, uh, and the borders of countries change uh, with, as a result of political evolution. So this choice is never neutral and um, uh, it must be taken, but we must take into consideration that uh, it is uh, it is a choice that has been made, and that can lead to um, inequalities among people. This is not necessarily unjust, let me emphasize that. If some form of compensation between uh, uh, linguistic groups is possible within a country or a territory, then if therefore this cost of adaptation can be offset, then uh, the choice of using uh, less 
rather than more official languages can be justified. So we can, of course, uh, um, uh, we could, if we had more time, go in much more of that. There are uh, uh, researchers and, uh, and uh, uh, in, in language policy and planning discussing precisely what are the, 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 the criteria that should be followed to redistribute resources. But the bottom line here is simply that the fundamental language policy is not neutral as such, and uh, that um, uh, the, the inequalities created by that distribution, of, that initial distribution of resources, could be offset by different compensations, could be monetary, could be uh, in, um, in other forms. Uh, so, as you see here, uh, there is this, this, is, this is a key uh, aspect in, uh, in, in language policy and planning because uh, not only the choice of one or two or three languages um, is not uh, something that um, cannot, be, uh, cannot be rediscussed. Uh, it's a choice as anyone, any choice can be, can be changed. But it, it gives the duty to government to take into consideration uh, redistributive policies in order to compensate for uh, the cost of adoption of other people if, uh, um, uh, if these compensations are possible. And I'd like to come back now to, well, to move forward to the second uh, part of the presentation in which I, I add on top of um, uh, the the general consideration about the role of the government uh, in, uh, in, in the original, in the fundamental language po policy, uh, and like to have further considerations about the need for state intervention in language matters. So not only, this is the key message, not only language policies cannot be avoided, at least, though I repeat myself, at least those policies that are related to fundamental um, the fundamental functioning of government. Uh, not only, as I say, these are these policies, language policies cannot be avoided by their nature, but language policy very often is also desirable from an economic, from the point of view of welfare economics. <clears throat> so there are different goods. I cannot unfortunately go too much into detail in this presentation, but I would like to give you a sense of what I'm calling. So um, economics is uh, the science that is concerned with the, with the study of allocation of resources and distribution of resources. Uh, so how resources must be allocated in order to avoid waste? What is the most efficient way of using the resources in society? This is the key, uh, one of the key questions in economics and this refers to the dimension called, uh, called um, uh, allocation or efficiency. Um, uh, in general, the economists uh, show that under certain circumstances and assumptions that are pretty strong, but you know, um, I don't have the time to go into detail now, but under different situations, under different assumptions and situations, uh, the free, uh, the spontaneous interaction between individuals in society through uh, the, <clears throat> the interplay between demand and supply. So, uh, spontaneous interactions happening in the free market. Well, the, the, the result of these spontaneous interactions uh, is going to um, lead to the economy towards an efficient use of resources. So where supply and demand meet and an exchange happen for a given, for a given price. Uh, and uh, this is a very strong argument for, to let um, uh, the market work uh, without interference from the government, with the exception of just enforcing property rights. And this is, if you want, um, the, um, the, uh, this is the, uh, the metaphor of the invisible hand of Adam Smith. And by and large, um, for many commodities, it works like that. But there are many goods um, <clears throat> that uh, we need in society that for efficiency reasons uh, uh, should be provided and sometimes produced by government. Uh, and these are what economists call public goods or collective goods. They have different properties. The most important one is that they cannot, 
be, uh, they are not rival in consumption. I uh, just give you a very sh very simple example to to uh, to understand what we're talking about. Think about, for example, public lighting or public defense. This is a textbook example. So, uh, once you walk, or, or to be more precise, when you walk in the evening in your city and uh, streets are lit and uh, the fence is provided by police forces, once this good is provided, uh, for example, public lighting, uh, well, there's no way of excluding someone from enjoying that good um, and at the same time the good provided uh, uh, streets, uh, you know, public, public lighting uh, is not rival in consumption. That is, that the fact that you use that good, you enjoy that good, does not detract someone else from enjoying the same good at exactly the same time. Whereas when you eat an apple, that good is clearly rival because if I eat that apple, you cannot eat the same apple. And this is clearly excludable because if I eat uh, one, one apple, I can exclude you from eating the same apple at the same time. Uh, so, collective goods uh, such as um, uh, national defense, public lighting, but also road signs and broadcasting, unless we use you know, scramble devices um, uh, or decoders, uh, they have these characteristics of, of being non-rival and non-excludable in consumption and, and, uh, and uh, these goods are for efficiency reasons provided by the government. Well, the re why this is the case? Well, the reason is pretty, pretty simple. Imagine that how, how could it could be possible uh, to, to fund, uh, I mean technically, to fund public lighting in, in, a, uh, in a street um, you should, if you should, have, for example, put a coin for every pole or every uh, 50 meters of your walk, that would be very difficult to provide. Or more fundamentally, if a private company provided that good, uh, the risk would be that the private company providing uh, street lighting would not cover the cost of production because people have a clear incentive to. Uh, of to free ride, so not to pay for the good they are consuming, or to underestimate, uh, or to underdeclare, to underestimate their willingness to contribute to that good. Because once it is provided, everyone can benefit from uh, street lighting, uh, no matter how much you contribute to that. It's not just as you when you buy a commodity you have to pay for this. These goods, precisely because they are not rival and not excludable. Uh, it's very difficult to, um, for, the, for these technical reasons to avoid free riding. So uh, imagine when you go, uh, for example, uh, to walk in another city instead of your own city. You move for an evening to visit friends for a party and you walk in the, in the cities, uh, in, the, in the streets of another city. You don't contribute basically to uh, supporting the costs of that public good. You just enjoy that good. It would be very difficult for you uh, to pay for that and it will be very difficult for a private provider to collect money for this. So these goods are generally um, funded by taxation and, uh, and, and, uh, and provided uh, and sometimes produced by, by the, the government. Um, uh, there are also other goods who can be provided by the market. Mm, for example, education or healthcare. There are many private schools and um, private clinics. But in many countries, as I said at the beginning, uh, these goods are provided by the government, not exclusively, but uh, uh, to a large extent they are provided by the government for fairness reasons. Um, the, the idea is that uh, with healthcare uh, and, and education in particular, all these social, social policies are carried out by governments because um, it's, it's, the, the key idea is not your fault if you get ill or education should be given to children irrespectively of the income of their parents. Children cannot make uh, informed uh, choices about their education and these choices necessarily are influenced by parents' income uh, if there is no free education for everyone. So for equity reasons very often 
then the government provides these uh, these um, goods uh, and services. So some of these goods, including collective goods, for example, road signs um, or broadcasting, once you broadcast news on the web, unless you use the recorder, well, the, the broadcast is accessible to everyone as free of charge. Basically, you don't have to pay. Uh, you just need a TV or a mobile phone or a smartphone or a radio and you can get access to these goods. That's why, by the way, these goods are generally covered by general taxation, precisely because it's very difficult to cover the cost through normal prices. So anyway, so public goods, collective goods that are non-rival and non-excludable, such as road signs, broadcasting uh, of news and, uh, and institutional websites, um, um, and and uh, public services that are provided by uh, the government, at least to some extent, such as healthcare and education. Well, all these goods have a linguistic component, and the government must make decisions, either implicit or implicit, as to which languages these goods are provided. So, not only there are some uh, uh, language choices that must be made, for example, uh, publishing official documents in a given language must do, of course, in a language. So this is what I call fundamental language policy. But there are also other um, social policies with, with linguistic components, such as healthcare and education, and many goods that are provided, collective goods provided by the government, sometimes also produced, that have a linguistic component, such as road signs uh, or the, the, the use of languages of banknotes, that are provided by government because of efficiency reasons. L leaving these, uh, the production of these documents to the market will be uh, less efficient from a point of view of, of economics. So as already mentioned, the problem of free riding uh, for the case of uh, national defense and public lighting, these are not goods, uh, collective goods, I mean with a specific or particular linguistic component, but there are many other goods that have a linguistic component and that must be uh, addressed. Uh, uh, there, there are also other goods that involve uh, positive or negative externalities, um, uh, which requires uh, for efficiency reasons or recommends for efficiency reasons the intervention of government. Think, for example, about uh, language uh, shift and decline. Um, uh, when people decide not to transmit uh, their language to children, they, they, they create a disutility, so a disadvantage, also to, I mean, to those who are already speakers of that language, who uh, lose one potential uh, partner in communication. Uh, by the same token, reversing the, the argument, there are also positive externalities. So when you decide to learn one foreign language, i.g., I don't know, Spanish, uh, assuming that your native tongue is, say, French or English, then you decide to learn this new language, people already speaking that language will have a new potential partner in communication without bearing costs for that. Language shift and decline is the reverse. By not transmitting a language to your children, you subtract basically potential communication partners to other people already speaking the language, typically a threatened language. So, again, leaving the spread of a language or uh, the, the, the fight against uh, language decline to the free forces of the market uh, will lead to a suboptimal sub result because of precisely these externalities that economists have uh, analyzed. So for efficiency reasons, very often language policies are required either because uh, it is necessary for the provision of collective goods or to address the externality problem. Um, for example, in the case of language shift and decline, it would be very useful uh, to, uh, uh, for the government to support uh, the language through uh, the provision of education in the minority language. Uh, and and as, as regards next to externalities, if the spread of a common language is, is something desirable in society, it's much more effective 
uh, that uh, spreading it through uh, language policy rather than just waiting that people uh, do this themselves. But I don't have the time to go too much into detail. We have to move to the this, this third part. So there's also equity reasons behind language policy, as I already said. Uh, there are, I mean, there are many public services that are provided um, that are provided by the government for equity reasons, and these goods, such as educational healthcare, they can have a linguistic component. Uh, um, accessing bilingual education for all members of a minority uh, is 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 one example. So. Um, if education is is a, is, a, is a good that the government wants to provide to all population, but also bilingual education for members of the minority is a form of uh, language policy based on equity concerns. Uh, the government could provide education just in one language, but then members of the minority language should have to pay private uh, education if they want to be scholarized to be schooled in their minority language or they must just give up their language. So um, a bilingual education policy in that respect uh, can be seen as uh, a language policy based on, uh, on, uh, uh, on uh, equity concerns. There are also other language policies that can be based on equity concerns. Um, for example, the, the right or duty for migrants to learn the host country dominant language. Uh, the government can provide uh, can provide uh, very cheap or free language courses in the local dominant language in order to uh, promote the linguistic integration of migrants in a country. So I'd like to conclude this part by presenting, discussing this um, quote from, from the British linguist Ed Crystal saying, many linguists I quote very often this because I think it's interesting. Many linguists have held the view that language change is a natural, spontaneous phenomenon, the results of underlying social and linguistic forces that is impossible or undesirable to tamper with. We should leave our language alone. And however, he says, language planning studies have shown that it is quite possible for social group to alter the course of a language that the question of desirability is highly controversial one. So as we saw in this presentation, this linguistic laissez-faire essentially does not exist. So you cannot just leave your language alone. It's simply not possible um, for efficiency reasons, for equity reasons, and uh, by the very, the very nature of uh, the, the government as a, public, uh, as a public construct. So the question, therefore, is no, is not whether uh, we should adopt, uh, uh, we should believe in less affair or not, but uh, this you know, refers to the first citation I made, but what type of language policy do we need and what are the, the consequences of our choices, of our linguistic choices, both, both in terms of efficiency and in terms of fairness. So I'd like to conclude very briefly this presentation with an example. Uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the papers that you have to read for this lecture, there's already a lot uh, uh, about this, so I'm not going to um, go too much into detail. Um, but it's, I think it's useful to focus on the case of the European Union before and after Brexit. So uh, I recall how was the, uh, the situation of the, the beginning of the European history in 1952 with the foundation of the European Community for Steel and Coal, later uh, European Economic Community, where uh, the six founding members adopted a, a multilingual language regime based on their official languages, so Dutch, French, German and Italian at that time. The situation today is much more different. Uh, although the United Kingdom left, uh, the EU English is still um, an official language um, uh, of, of the European Union. The regulation, uh, the number one, that uh, list, lists the, uh, the official language was not changed um, and is gone, it's not going to be changed because uh, English is an official language in Ireland, not a national language, but uh, Irish, which is also an official language of the EU, is spoken by a very tiny percentage of the population in the Republic of Ireland, so uh, without English many people on the island will be excluded from communication. So. Anyway, today we are in a situation in which the European Union has uh, 27 member states and 24 official languages. Um, regularly, 
especially after each enlargement, many people, uh, I mean, some observers to be more precise, uh, both in the academics and journalists, uh, push the idea that it, it is now the time to give up multilingualism and to adopt English as uh, the lingua franca of Europe. Uh, some people uh, argue that it would be better to use just three languages, namely English, French and German, or six, depending on the observation. Recently, The Economist, uh, well, recently, one year ago, uh, argued that Brexit, as you can see here in this slide, is the ideal moment to make English the EU common language, because it will be a neutral lingua franca. This is clearly uh, wrong because English is the native language of 2% of the European population, uh, essentially people living in the Republic of Ireland, so it cannot be a lingua franca because it's one of the native languages of uh, people making up uh, the, uh, the Union. However, many people will argue that 2% is not that large and therefore that uh, using only one language uh, would be uh, much better from different point of view. The first point of view is that uh, the costs of multilingualism are too high um, and uh, even economically unsustainable. Some people argue this is, uh, if you read the data, not true. The last figures we have for 2012 show that the EU spends roughly 1 billion euros per year on translation and interpreting which is less than 1% of the European budget, and uh, this amounts to 3 euros for uh, adult residents, more or less, and it corresponds to 0.0085% of the European Union GDP. So it means that if your net salary, for example, is $24,000 per year, so $2,000 per month, 0.0085% would amount to $2 per year, which is clearly uh, not unsustainable. So the reasons are not real uh, budgetary reason to reduce the number of languages. Some, some people argue that um, changing the fundamental language policy of the EU, so adopting uh, one language only or three languages only instead of 24, would increase the effectiveness of EU communication, would improve cohesion within the European Union, and would contribute to the creation of a genuine European uh, demos as opposed to uh, ethnos. So a, a, a European demos uh, uh, would promote communication among Europeans and the emergence of a European public sphere. Well, um, I have serious reservation with this, you know, um, but we will discuss this at the end of this lecture. I'm already running late. So I just would like here to uh, propose some general considerations about this uh, idea. So. Uh, uh, changing the fundamental language policy of the European Union. So instead of providing official website, official documents, treaties, legal texts in 24 languages, what will be the results of pro uh, producing this material only in one language? At least one, of course, must be used, um, as already said at the beginning of this lecture. Well, we have to analyze very clearly uh, and very precisely what would be the consequences of that choice, both in terms of allocation of resources or efficiency and in terms of fairness. Well, the situation of before Brexit was uh, the following one, as we can see in this slide. In this slide, I, I use uh, data from Eurostat, the European Union Agency for Statistics, um, I have already quoted these uh, results in different publications. I think they are still rather actual. So um, I use here a database published in 2013, the Adult Education Survey, and I'm focusing on the European Union with 28 uh, member states, excluding Croatia, the Netherlands, and Romania because of lack of data. So the UK is included, though this is the scenario before Brexit. And uh, on, the, on the first column, you say the, the rate of linguistics exclusion uh, associated with uh, different uh, language choices. So uh, in the case of rate of linguistic exclusion means the percentage of the resident population uh, who is not able to understand any of the official languages. So we 22 official languages, uh, I exclude here Romanian and Croatian because Croatian and Romania are excluded from my data set, but results don't change. 0% of resident population in the remaining 25 countries are excluded. 
You may argue that some people are not really interested in what happened in Brussels, but the European Union is not an international organization. It's an organization that uh, has much larger powers than any other uh, supranational organization. Uh, European law uh, can be applied directly to the situation of citizens and residents without, sometimes depending on the competence of the EU, uh, sometimes without being uh, without the need of being filtered, so to, so, so to say, uh, by national parliament. So it's very important that people have access to documents. Uh, they may not be concerned today, but they can be concerned tomorrow. Uh, forget, for example, about, not, not to mention, I mean, all documents that are related to traveling, uh, to the rights of travelers or to transnational issues such as COVID or mobility. There are many, many information that the European Union provides to citizens that can be very relevant for their life. So with a full multilingual regime, no one is excluded, at least potentially. 26% um, of the population has no knowledge of English, French and German. That was before Brexit. And 45% of the resident population has no knowledge of English at all. So using just one language uh, would exclude more or less half percent of the population. But this without considering the fact that many people just have very um, elementary, uh, elementary, I mean, very basic knowledge of foreign languages. So if we include in uh, the percentage of residents only those who are not, uh, who are, sorry, who are either native speakers or who are, who declare to speak a foreign language at a very, very good level, so proficient level, a level that is likely to be the level requested to read complex texts, well, then the situation changes a lot. Because figures say that almost 80% of the population of the EU before Brexit either was not a native speaker of English or could not speak the language uh, uh, at all or it could, not, or, or it could speak it uh, just at the basic of intermediate level. So basically only 20% of the resident population was either native speakers of that language or uh, um, fluent in it. 50% of the population uh, were not uh, is not fluent in, in uh, or, or ignore completely um, uh, any language between uh, English, French and German. And 4% of the population still uh, does not speak uh, fluently at least, or to a good level, any of the 20, uh, uh, 22 languages considered in my data set. Uh, these are essentially minorities speaking Russian in Baltic countries or Arabic or Turkish, um, those who come from migration or uh, minorities that uh, whose language is not officially recognized. So how is going this uh, situation change after Brexit? But it's going to be worse. It's going to be worse because the um, uh, linguistic, uh, um, the rate of linguistics exclusion, also known as linguistic disenfranchisement rate in the literature, are going to increase very simply because the largest uh, English-speaking countries in Europe will uh, has already withdrawn from the European Union. So after Brexit, and I use here two different data sets to reinforce my conclusions, more than 50% of the European population has no knowledge of English at all, and 90% of the European population either does not know the language or uh, know it, knows it only at the basic or intermediate levels. So only 10% of the European population is native speaker of English, so basically the, the Irish plus 8-7% of non-native speakers who are fluent in that. Uh, linguistic disenfranchisement rates for uh, associated with trilingual language regime English, French and German are going to increase as well. So after Brexit, the importance of multilingualism and providing uh, um, uh, documents in more than one language, more than three, is even more important. Unfortunately, from that point of view, uh, the European Commission is doing exactly the contrary. The, users, the exclusive use of English is increasing all the time, uh, constantly. Uh, there is probably um, a lack of perception in Brussels about the real competencies of uh, linguistic competencies of European citizens. Let's move now to the study of um, 
the distributive effect. So as regards uh, the allocation of resources, using just one language is clearly ineffective because, as we saw, uh, it will exclude uh, more than half percent of the population, even 90 percent, depending on the indicator used. So it's clearly not efficient uh, by any sense. But it's also very unequal. Uh, here, I report the, the, uh, the percentage of the population, uh, always, always using data from Eurostat, um, in four countries, namely Germany, Spain, France and Italy, the percentage of the population declaring not to be able to speak English at any level, according to their income. So people belong to the 10th decile, this is a statistical distribution, people belonging to the 10th decile of the income distribution are defined as the 10% of the population with the relatively higher highest household income. So the rich, let's say like this, although it's not precisely correct, but those who are wealthier. So look, for example, the last column. 12% of the population uh, belonging to the 10th decile of the income distribution. So the, those who are wealthiest uh, in Germany does not speak English at all. So not a big percentage, but this percentage is much higher for people belonging to the first decile or the first decile of the income distribution. So for example, uh, more than 50% uh, of that population. The same happens in other European countries. For example, in France, 60% uh, of the population with the lowest uh, incomes uh, has no knowledge of English, whereas this percentage is much, much lower, just 26% um, for those belonging to the 10th the, the of this side of the income distribution. Basically, it means that those who are uh, less uh, those who are relatively poorer have also less uh, skills in foreign languages, including English, and they are much less likely to understand documents, whatever type of document it is, if this is not published in their own native language. In that case, uh, it's mostly for most people German, uh, French, Italian, and in Spain, uh, Spanish, or even other minority language or other languages such as Catalan or Basque. Uh, here I present results, uh, the same results, but uh, uh, I use a, as a breakdown uh, the level of education completed. Here I focused on citizens, adult citizens rather than residents. So you see here three countries in the European Union, but this is more or less you, you see the same for all countries, namely Spain, France, and Italy. Those uh, uh, those belonging to those in these countries who have completed uh, university education, uh, formerly known as tertiary education, they are much more likely, and this is not surprising, but this is, these are data, they are much more likely to have at least some knowledge of the English than those who just completed lower uh, secondary education or upper secondary education. For example, in the case of France, just 20% of people who completed university declared to be able to speak at least some English, whereas this percentage is much, much, um, um, sorry, 20% of the population declare not to be able to speak any English at any level, whereas this percentage, so people who don't know English at any level, not, not even a single word, uh, uh, word, uh, word are uh, much, much more, 73%. Uh, in the case of Spain, for example, 90% of those who just completed lower secondary education uh, has no knowledge of English at all. This percentage is lower, but still significant for those who completed tertiary education. So, to conclude on that, uh, empirical evidence shows that a monolingual language regime, as the language regime proposed by the economist based on English um, only, will be clearly ineffective uh, potentially highly discriminating and will have regressive effects among social groups because it will be particularly detrimental to members of the weakest groups in societies in society in, in, in almost all European countries in particular uh, uh, to the least educated citizens and residents and those belonging to the lowest income classes and this is going to um, these effects are going to become even uh, uh, stronger after Brexit. So rather than being a lingua franca for Europe, uh, it will be highly discriminatory language regime to use English only. Um, uh, so there is a case rather to move uh, towards uh, a stricter implementation of multilingualism 
rather than removing multilinguals. Um, probably um, an English-only language regime uh, will be um, acceptable for some very tiny percentage of the population, clearly cosmopolitan elites, but not for the vast majority of the population. Uh, it would even detrimental probably for the European construction in that respect because it could fuel sentiment, populist sentiments, anti-European sentiments in many countries uh, if the European Union, uh, especially the Commission, does not make the effort to be uh, to show to be as close as possible to European citizens, and this implies, of course, uh, using their native languages. So results support the claim that translation and interpreting by making possible to implement a full multilingual regime contribute to the social cohesion of the EU and probably also to European democracy. Uh, so this is an example uh, in which I applied uh, some fundamental concepts developed in the first part of this lecture. So uh, the concept of efficiency and fairness, uh, the analysis of what type of goods and services government also at the international level provides to citizens and I hope I managed to give you an idea about what could be the effects in terms of allocation of resources, of distribution of resources, of using uh, just one language instead of uh, two, three or even 24. Uh, it is of course just an example, we can discuss many other countries, but what the bottom line here is I hope that this example um, contributes for the discussion in your classroom by making clear that uh, language choices are choices uh, and these choices can be evaluated both in terms of efficiency and fairness. Some choices cannot be avoided but not all choices are equal. Thanks very much for your attention and if you want to have more information about uh, my presentation I suggest here two papers written in the two official languages of Canada. Thanks a lot again and see you next week for the discussion.